Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas to you all. And to all a good night. No, it's just, just kidding. No, it's good to be here. This is the first, honestly, this is the first time Christmas has fallen on a Sunday since I've been pastor. So it's the first time we get to have an actual Christmas service on Christmas. I know, it's awesome. I actually get to celebrate on the day that it's supposed to be. That's awesome. Well, if you have a Bible with you, and after all, you're at church, so you should have a Bible. If you don't, that's okay too. You know why? Because it's a church. All right, we have Bibles, and we have a big wall right there. This wall is awesome. So you can just stare at that wall while I look at Matthew chapter 1. There it is. Matthew chapter 1. If you have a Bible, uh, open it to Matthew chapter 1 and have everyone please stand so we can read God's Word together this morning. We're going to be Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to be talking, of course, this morning about Easter. Because... Oh, hold on. Wrong, yeah, wrong message. It's Christmas. We're going to talk about Christmas this morning, not Easter. That would be silly. What would Easter, that wouldn't make any sense at all. Wrong color scheme and everything. Matthew chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 18 through 25. And it says this. It says, The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph got up from sleep, he did as the Lord Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not know her intimately, intimately until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Father, we come to you this morning, and we're just so thankful for all that you've given to us. Lord, we ask that you would just speak to us this morning as we celebrate your birthday. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for the greatest gift that was ever given, and that's you, Jesus, being born for us. And Lord, I ask that you would just speak to us now through your words, And we just praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I I heard this story recently of a uh, a couple that had been uh, they'd been married for about ten years and they uh, were constantly trying to have children, but uh, they just couldn't conceive. So. Uh, they talked about the the change, transition in their life from uh, 2001 uh, Christmas. They did their normal thing. They, you know, went to parties, uh, you know, family gatherings. They exchanged gifts. They did the couple thing, desperately wanting and praying for a child. So, because it wasn't going to happen biologically, the doctor said they decided that they were going to seek uh, adoption. So they went about this process of adoption, and, and they worked really hard at it. And just a few days before Christmas of 2002, they get a phone call. Actually, it was about a week before they get a phone call. It says uh, to the, they were the Baileys, and it said to them, um, we have uh, what you've been looking for. We, we, we have... Uh, a family for you. And so uh, Tiffany, who is the, uh, the wife, and Mike, who is the, the husband, said, you mean you guys have a child? And the voice on the other end says, no children, if you want them. And they said, children. How many children? Five. <laughs> 
So they, it said that they laughed about it, they talked about it, they prayed, obviously, and they knew this instant family was what God had had for them. So they traveled to the foster home, and there was Bethany, Elizabeth, Sonny, Marie, and Suzette were all waiting for them. These five children were there, and so the Baileys come in, and they look at the children, and the children look at them, and they said suddenly everybody just broke out with huge smiles. They said there was just an instant connection. These children were so excited to have a family. The Baileys were excited to have a family. So they take them home. They get home just a a couple days before uh, Christmas. uh, And it said that their whole Christmas changed. They had to go out and get all of these different things for them. They they said that they had to... uh, they had to get clothes, food, uh, kiss on the cheek. They had to uh, learn how to, what the rules were. They had to learn to play all these games that the kids wanted to play. And so the Mike had to learn how to wrestle uh, with, the, with the boys. And they were just, it said their whole world changed from one Christmas to the next because of adoption. And you know, adoption is the story of Christmas. It, it, we don't talk about it a whole lot, but adoption for the Baileys changed their life. The adoption that comes from Christmas changes the whole world. And there's a great theme of adoption found in the Christmas story. When we read uh, the Chris, different Christmas stories, like for instance, last night we talked Uh, we shared from Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story. And that is from the perspective of Mary. That's the Christmas story uh, and the perspective from Mary. But in Matthew chapter 1, the verses we just read, is the perspective. It's another account of the same thing, but it's from the point of Joseph's eye. And it's a story about adoption, you see, because we know that Joseph played no part in the biological making of this child. None. I mean, even Mary says in Luke chapter 2, like, wait a minute, how can I be, how is it that I'm going to conceive a child when I've never even been with a man? And then Joseph, when he finds out Mary's pregnant, is like, whoa, 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 hold on. How is it that you're having a child when we haven't been together? Right? And, and, and so, in fact, it was such a, a difficult thing for Joseph, he was really crushed by the news. I mean, imagine they're, they're engaged to be married and uh, they're, they're happy. And all of a sudden, Mary drops this bombshell of, oh, I'm having a baby. And um, I, I'm strange like this, but I just imagine that conversation, right? Where Joseph's like, you're what? I'm pregnant. Who's the father? God. How do you respond to that? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, I mean, that, that's got to be a little awkward. I mean, how do you, you know, like, I'm sorry, what? But it says that he was so crushed by the news that it's an interesting thing. Because it says that he was going to divorce her secretly. But the reason he was going to do that, the reason he was going to send her away was to protect her. Because in that time, the, the, the shame and the punishment coming from adultery could have cost Mary her life. And Joseph didn't want to see that because obviously he loved her. So he didn't want to see that. So uh, he was going to go about doing this. And, but then God intervened. God came to Joseph, right? Sent the angel to him while he was sleeping and changed his news, right? He has this midnight encounter with the messenger of God who says, no, 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 it's okay. You can take Mary as your wife. And you are going to be the father to this child. Joseph, from that moment, from that encounter with God, his life changed because he became the adoptive father of Jesus. Think about that for a moment. And he did everything that an adoptive father would do, right? And when it says here, uh, one of the things I, I love Uh, In verse 25, it says, uh, you know, but did not know uh, her intimately until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Right? We know God said to Mary, you're going to name him Jesus. Right? We know that the angel that came to Joseph said, you're going to name him Jesus. But as was the custom of that day, 
It was the job of the Father to announce for the very first time publicly the name of the child. That was an honor that only went to the Father. So Joseph got to go into public for the first time and to proclaim publicly that the name of this child was Jesus. He took on the role of the Father. You know, uh, so much is made of Mary and uh, the, the, this amazing task that she was given, rightfully so. But you can't forget that as Mary was chosen, so was Joseph. God chose Joseph to be the father to his son. Joseph adopted Jesus as his own. He took this child from God and he made him his own. Adoption. This is the adoption of Christmas. Right? That we, we see this story that Jesus was adopted by Joseph. But it's an illustration as well as the adoption that we have when God adopts us. We are adopted children of God. In three separate passages I want to read to you from the New Testament, God uses this analogy, the same wording of adoption. In Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5, it says this, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us, predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself, according to his favor and will. From the foundation, before the foundation of the world, it said that God's plan in love was to adopt you and I. To adopt you and I. It wasn't a biological thing, it was a love thing. He said, you are my children. You're going to be adopted through Jesus Christ to himself. Romans 8.23 says it this way. It says, and not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Eagerly waiting for adoption. Because adoption is a Christmas story. The Christmas story is a story of adoption. Do you realize that what that means? That God, our Father, adopts us the way any adoptive father would adopt a child. Right? Like Joseph, God is ready to give you uh, certain things that come with being part of the family. Consider the wonderful thought of being adopted into God's family. Right? I mean, we think that like Annie, right? The story of Annie is an amazing story, right? Good old Daddy Warbucks adopts Annie. Oh, he's adopted by a rich man. God adopts us. We are, I mean, think about that for a minute. My adopted dad is loaded, right? He can give me anything and everything. And it's his heart's desire to give me anything and everything. And not to spoil me, but because he loves me. He provides for us. You see, every adoption, this is one of the principles we need to understand this morning, is that every adoption has a foundation of love. When Joseph accepted Jesus as his son, it was because of the love that he had for him. It was founded in love. Right? We see later on that Mary and Joseph have other children. Right? They would be considered, technically they would be step, or I mean not step, they'd be half brothers and sisters of Jesus, but we don't ever see it referred to that way. They were just brothers and sisters, right? Just makes me think of uh, Jimmy Dudley, right? There's no half, there's no steps, they're, they're just children, his children. God says the same thing, you're not my half children, you're not, you are my children, adopted from you, or adopted from this world through it. Think about the, think about, we know the, the, the love and the care and the concern that Joseph had for this child, like it was his own. Because remember when Jesus is 12, right? And they're traveling and they all of a sudden they realize that they don't have Jesus and they go back looking for Jesus and they find him in the temple and he's teaching. And this is what Mary says to him in Luke 
uh, 2, verse 48, it says, Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. Your father and I. We see this anxiously looking for you. It refers to, it shows you the, the care and the concern that both of them were equally tortured and afraid and worried about Jesus. Joseph wasn't like, oh, no big deal. He's not my kid anyway. No, they both went seeking and looking for their son. Mary even says, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. There's no, I mean, there, there's, when you, uh, in, in this adoption, in this process, when you become a parent, the, your, your heart is given over to that child. It's no different. It's not different just because they're not biologically yours. It's the same love and connection. It's the same love, in fact, that we see in John 3.16 when it said, For God so loved the world. It's that same love. It's that unconditional love. And it's the catalyst for our salvation. Right? God loved us so much that he gave his son for us. There's no greater love than that. It's a love that's focused on you, a child of God. A child that God wanted. And he adopted us. You see, adoptive parents will protect their children from harm. Right? We, we, see, we'll see, we would see later on, right, in Matthew chapter 2, the word comes to Joseph that uh, Herod has sent uh, murderers, I mean, people coming into the area to slaughter all the boys, the male children, to make sure that his throne isn't threatened. So Joseph... He receives this supernatural news, right? And he immediately acts to protect his family, right? He, he takes them to Egypt. We know the story. He, he flees with them by night so that they could be uh, protected. He was doing what a father does. Parents protect their children from harm. God protects us from harm. God's motivation of love right? His motivation we see in John 3, 16, for God to love the world, that he sent his only begotten son. Why? Because he was motivated by love to protect us from harm. There's a harm that comes from not knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. There's a harm that comes in missing out on heaven. And God doesn't want us to have that. He didn't want that harm to be there for us. So he's adopted us so we could be protected from that. I heard the story recently uh, from a Navy chaplain. God bless you. He was a Navy chaplain, but he was assigned to a Marine battalion, uh, and he had just come back from Iraq. And one of the many things he did while he was there as the chaplain for this group is he would pray with any of the uh, folks who, any of the men and women who were uh, going out into patrol, any of them wanted to be prayed with, he would go and he would pray with them. He'd pray them for every single, no matter what time of day, he would be there and he would pray with them before they go out on patrol. And he was asked, did the ones you prayed with always return safely? And his answer was no. In fact, many of the Marines who did not return were, bo were born again Christians. He said, I had to make their funeral arrangements and contact their families. You see, it's true, just like with the chaplain sharing with those soldiers going out into battle, we are not always protected from, or God doesn't necessarily shield us from tragedy. But you see, there's a difference. You see, God goes beyond the funeral. He goes beyond the crisis, beyond the pain, beyond the tragedy, and says, when you come to this experience, I will be there to take you through it. Even in death. The thing that's one of the scariest things in all of uh, our minds is this thought of death. And it says, God says, even then I will take care of you, especially there. He says, you can't be hurt here. Death loses its sting. It loses its punch. It can't hurt you because God says, I will protect you. And he protects us because he is our father. And he wants the very best for you. 
If you've been adopted into God's family, he'll protect you from the greatest danger of all, which is missing eternity in heaven. And lastly, adoptive children have the full and rightful place in the family. As I said, we know that Jesus had other brothers and sisters, but he had the full part in that family. Everybody around who saw Jesus and saw the family came together. Everybody identified Jesus as Joseph's son. That is Joseph's son. And that is Joseph's son. And one of the reasons they knew that is because guess who proclaimed his name? It was Joseph. So they said the father proclaims his name. Joseph proclaims his name. There's Jesus' father. What an amazing thing. He was part of Joseph's family. In John 1 verses 12 through 13 it says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. You've been adopted. Merry Christmas. You have an adoption, right? You can go tell people, I've been adopted. Hallelujah, right? Might confuse some people, especially if you're at a family gathering and your parents are there. And you say, I've been adopted. And they're going to be like, what? How did you know? No, just, just, just kidding. That only works with my little sister when I convinced her that she was adopted. But I didn't really think it through because I thought it would be like a bad thing, but then I realized it's a good thing, right? So we have to change that. Now we have to tell her that we were adopted and that the mom and dad wanted us and not her. But that's, that's not good. <laughs> this is Christmas. I shouldn't be talking things like that, but it's kind of true. We were born of God. You're in the family. If you are a believer, you are in the family of God. You've got brothers and sisters all over the world, all throughout time. What an amazing family reunion that's going to be, right? That's an amazing thing, honestly. There's an amazing thing about coming into contact with another believer. No matter where I've been in the world, when I'm around other Christians, there's a connection. There's something unique about it. Right? It, it, seriously, we look at each other and we look very different, but yet we can see the family resemblance. It's like a family that's finally being united. And that's the amazing thing. And that's the, the uh, really, that's the, the, the story of our life. That when we leave this world, we become united again with our family. Those who we were biologically connected with, and those who we are adopted with by God. We have this family resemblance. Jesus had the full right of his family from his birth until his death. God doesn't take shortcuts when it comes to the inheritance and the rights of his adopted children. You see, when you're adopted by God, everything God has is yours. Right? Galatians 4 tells us that we are, since we are his children, we are heirs to all of his riches. And one day we will have all of those amazing things. We'll even get to spend time with our adopted dad in heaven for eternity. We have a home in heaven, eternal life. We'll know love beyond all description, right? Peace beyond any understanding. We'll have joy that can't even possibly be described when we realize that we are adopted by God. I want to close with a story. And the story of a, a woman who had, uh, it was just a, a week or two before Christmas, she had lost her husband. And she was an older woman. And because she had lost her husband, they, you know, and he was really sick, they didn't have an opportunity to decorate, and she didn't really want to decorate. She wasn't in the Christmas spirit at all. Christmas Eve, she's uh, sitting in her house, she has all the lights off, and there's a knock at her door. So she goes and she answers the door and there's a courier there and he has this big box and he said, this delivery's for you, ma'am. And uh, she says, what, what, what is it? And he opens up the box and inside there's a little baby golden retriever. And she goes, this isn't mine. He says, no, this is yours. It was meant to, it's supposed to be delivered to you. And she's like, what? And he's like, yep, I just need you to sign here. So she signs and she says, what this can't possibly be. He says, yep, there's a letter right here that explains it all. 
And she's like, who had this delivered to me? And he goes, your husband had it delivered to you. Merry Christmas. And he leaves. So she takes this puppy in the box and she sets it down next to her chair and she opens up this letter and it's a letter from her husband written three weeks before he passed. And it explains to her that he loves her, that he's going to miss her, that he can't wait for their reunion together. He said, I want you to know that I've been thinking about you. I wanted to provide for you. I didn't want you to be lonely. He said, so I got you this puppy. The puppy, she would later find out, was ordered by her husband when the mom of the dog was still pregnant. He said, I didn't want you to be alone for Christmas. He said, so until we meet again, he said, here is someone to keep you company. So she looks down, and here is this little golden retriever puppy looking up at her. And she realized from that moment on that he provided for her even when she thought there was going to be a separation. God provided for us. When he looked down from heaven, he loved us so much that he couldn't imagine us being separated. And he said, you know what? Until we can be together face to face, I'm going to send someone to you as a present, as a gift to you on Christmas. And he sent his son. And even when Jesus was leaving this earth to go back to the Father, he said, we're not going to leave you alone. We're going to give you the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be your comforter. And he's going to be your counselor. And he's going to be your guide. Until we all meet again. So congratulations. Merry Christmas. You've been adopted. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. And Lord, when I think about that, and I think of that phrase, Heavenly Father... You know, a lot of times in, in this world, Lord, people have challenging relationships with their father. But you are our adopted father. You are our father not because of biology, but because of love, because of an adoption. Father God, I thank you that you loved us so much that you sent us your son. And that even on his birthday, Lord, we're the ones who receive the great gifts. I thank you for your love for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your love for us as you loved us so much that you came to die for us. That the fullness of the gift, the fullness of what was being received in this world when Mary and Joseph looked at you on your birthday was not even fully known until Mary saw you upon the cross. Until you rose again from the grave. Conquering everything, including death. Lord, I thank you that we are joint heirs with you. I thank you that we are your brothers and sisters. And I thank you, Lord, for this amazing family that you've given to us. Many who we don't even know yet, but we will meet one day. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for protecting us. I thank you for all of the things that we have because we are your children. Because we, Lord Jesus, we are your brothers and your sisters. This morning, I would ask that you, each and every one of you, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would just pray that you would get to know your brother and sisters in Christ, that you'd spend time getting to know them. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I just want to say to you that he loves you, he died for you, he took the price for all of your sins upon himself, and he did that in love, not out of duty and obligation, but because he loves you. And he made this the salvation is so simple. He said, I've done all the work. I just need you to take the free gift. It's Christmas. If you don't have that free gift of salvation, Jesus is holding it out there. And he says, this is for you. Take that gift of salvation and just say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for the amazing gift on Christmas, which is salvation. Thank you for being my brother. Thank you for being my Lord and my Savior. 
And if you're saying that prayer this morning for the first time, would you just raise your hand? I just want to be able to pray for you if there's anyone this morning. As I said, if you've made that commitment already, then I want you to just spend some time with the family. I want you to, to let others know of this amazing gift that we've been given. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I thank you for this family. And Lord, I ask that you would be with all of us, each and every one of us, as we go about the rest of our Christmas. And Lord, I pray that we would never forget, no matter where we go, no matter what we do, no matter what gift is open, the greatest gift we've ever received is you. I thank you and I praise you. And I just want to wish you a happy birthday, Lord Jesus. Amen.